Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, The Eternal Promises of God. Today is the last day of Sukkot. And if you haven't seen our Sukkot video, I would encourage you to check it out. It's called the Feast of Sukkot, and it's found in our Nuggets of Truth section. After the Feast of Sukkot is over, eternity begins, and God makes two specific promises about eternity. One is really, really good and really, really exciting, and the other is not so good and even less exciting for whoever falls into that category. Let us turn to our scripture, please, to Matthew chapter 3, verse 14 through 21. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works has been carried out in God. Jesus starts out with the good promises first. Right now, what Jesus is doing, he's prophesying about his own death. And not only just his death, but the type of death that he would have to suffer. He said, just like Moses lifted up the bronze serpent on a pole, so he too must be lifted up on a tree. In other words, he was saying that he must suffer the death of crucifixion. But not for no reason. He suffered death by crucifixion so that that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus puts it another way in our beloved memory verse, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Verses 17 and 18 also talks about Jesus being the Savior of the world. Through this one righteous act, Jesus would save the whole world if you would only but believe in Him. If we would only come to Him, if we would only accept His free gift of life that He is offering us. And again, it is not for no reason that people should serve God. Jesus has promised great and mighty promises for his people. And to receive it, all you have to do is to believe. And you will inherit the promises of God. But believe what? Believe that Jesus is the only Son of God. That He gave His life so that you might live, so that I might live, and accept Him as Lord and Savior. And if we, who are Christians, if we have loved one have loved ones who are not serving the Lord. Well, if we have children who are not serving the Lord, if we have grandchildren who are not serving the Lord, oh, who, who have not accepted Him as Lord and Savior, then we should be down on our knees day and night with tears and pleas of mercy for our loved ones. It is not God's will that any should perish. He wants every single soul to be saved. Yet many, many will not be saved because they refuse to believe. They refuse to give up their sins, their iniquities. They refuse to repent 
of their sins. Because men love darkness more than they love the light. The problem is, they're educated under the secular educational system, which programs them to believe that there is no God. And even if there were, or even if there was a God, there's no need for God. And this is a worldwide problem. It's not just here in the US, but it's in Australia. It's in Europe, it's in Asia, it's in Africa, it's in the Caribbean, it's in all the nations of the world. We are living in the last days and, and the world has kicked God out of the world that he has created. But look at the warning that God gives us in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. It says, woe to you, earth, woe to you, sea, because the devil has come down to you and he's extremely angry. He is past upset. He's wroth with anger. He's foaming at the mouth because he knows that his time is short. But we who are saved have a great and lasting promise that we will overcome him. No matter how angry he gets, no matter how wroth he gets, we will overcome him. Look at, at the verse before the verse we just read, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. We are more than conquerors in the Lord Jesus. Look at, look at it. Their love, the love for their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is the foundation of their overcoming. We cannot use the blood of the Lamb in spiritual warfare without first loving Jesus. Likewise, without the love for Jesus, we will not have a testimony. Therefore, your greatest weapon is love. First of all, for Jesus, a love for Jesus Christ. For it is written, we love because he first loved us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. Then again in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 10. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps a good person, one would dare to even die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Jesus Christ chose he was not forced. He chose to die for the whole world while we were still his enemies. So that whomsoever will can come and be saved through his death. So that we might live through his resurrected life. Those are great and marvelous promises that Jesus has given us. Psalms 20 compares the righteous with a prosperous fruit bearing tree that is planted by streams of water. It's so prosperous that our leaves will not fade, our leaves will not wither. But if the wicked, this is what it says about the wicked, Psalms, uh, Psalms 1 verse 4, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. The wicked will be blown away like chaff in the wind. This word chaff, it, it, it means a non fruit bearing of a green plant, including the seed covering husks. Very light, 
so susceptible to being blown away in the wind. They are opposites to each other, the righteous and the unrighteous. We are fruit bearing. The unrighteous are none fruit bearing. We have eternal prosperity. They are eternally bankrupt. We have eternal life. They have eternal damnation. And it's all because of their blatant disbelief in your face rebellion. They shake their fist in the face of God. And they chant, we will not have him as king over us. They choose not to serve. They choose not to believe. They choose to do their own will, which is not the will of God, is the will of their father, the devil. With their actions, they deny the son of God. Therefore, their own blood is on their own heads. Look at what Ezekiel says in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 4 through 5. Then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. The trumpet sound are sounding right now. The trumpet calls are blaring out all over. The warning that Jesus is coming back real, real soon is ringing loud and clear. Even as we speak, this message in itself is a trumpet warning that Jesus is on his way back. Yet there are those who will hear this message and choose to ignore it. The scripture says that their blood will be upon their own heads. The reality is they have no excuse. There is nothing left now but the dreadful expectation of judgment. There's nothing left. They're, 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 there's nothing left to cover their sins or to take away their sins. Since they refuse, since they trampled on the blood of Jesus and they're ignored the clarion call of the trumpet. Paul announced or pronounced the same judgment on the Jews in Corinth. Turn with me to Acts chapter 18, verse 5 through 6. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. The Jews in Corinth refused to believe, just like they're doing today, just like the people all over the world are doing today. They refused to believe. They refused to serve. They even refused to listen. So Paul had no choice but to shake out his garments as a sign to them and exclaim that their blood was now on their own heads and he was innocent of their blood. And then he took the gospel to the Gentiles and they happily accepted what he was saying. I want to read a declaration that God made in Psalms chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. The enemies of God are all destined for ruination and everlasting judgment because they choose to be enemies of God. But no matter how they rail up against them, no matter how they revile them, no matter how they say all manner of evil against them, no matter if they even call him irrelevant or non-existent, it does not matter. He is and will always be eternally enthroned forever. Praise 
this holy name. I want us to look at a couple of other scriptures about eternal punishment of the unbeliever. Let us start with Matthew chapter 8 verse, verse 12. While the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into utter darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now skip down to Matthew chapter 13, verse 40 through 43. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, who has ears. Let him hear. And now, our last verse that we will read, Mark chapter 9, verse 43 through 48. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands and go to hell, to unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lean than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. An unquenchable fire awaits all those who oppose the Lord. A burning lake of fire for each and every one who rebels against the laws of the Lord Jesus. It will be much pain and much suffering in utter darkness. Not that God wants you to go there or that he sends you there, but you choose to go there by your decisions, the decisions that you make and your actions. I want to read a story to you in closing. I want to read a story. Uh, about a man who, who, who wrote a postcard to the fire department. Now, I don't know if the story is true or not, but the story goes something like this. One day a man in Blackpool, England, thought he detected the smell of burning timber, so he sat down and wrote a postcard about it to the, to the Blackpool fire, fire Brigade. When you come to my house, he asked, I can smell timber burning. When the firemen received the postcard some 24 hours later, they thought it was a joke. But as they weren't doing anything anyway, they decided to go and check it out and investigate to see who this practical joker was. When they arrived, you could just picture their surprise when they found the house was really on fire. Some timbers under the man's hearth were smoldering, and so they promptly extinguished the fire. This man was fortunate that the place hadn't burned to the ground because he waited 24 hours for the fire department to show up. Now, as I read that story, I thought, people today are just like this man. The return of Jesus is so close that you can almost hear the trumpet sounds, yet they're distracted with all kinds of things. They let everything distract them from the true riches of life, prayer, witnessing, Bible reading, Bible study, meditation. The reality of the eternal punishment is so near that you can almost hear the fire crackling and the smell of smoke rising up. Yet, People refuse to accept Jesus as Lord. They refuse to accept him as Savior, knowing full well that those who reject the Son of God is doomed to spend eternity in a place called the Lake of Fire. There are only two eternal promises in which one will spend eternity. One is a place of blissfulness, a place of peace and joy, a place where all your needs are met. There will be abundance. Supplies will be in abundance. Never will you have to worry again. Never will you have to be concerned again. Never will you be mistreated again. Never will you be misused again. Never will you have to fear and never will you be disrespected ever again. 
The second place is a place of eternal torment, a place of anguish and discomfort, a place without the love of God, forever thirsty, forever hungry, forever fear and agony in perpetual darkness. I counsel you today, choose wisely this day whom you will serve. For the day of the Lord is near and his rewards are with him. So let me ask you, are you ready for his return? Are you ready to meet Jesus? Have you made him your Lord and Savior? Do you depend on him to, to, to take your side on that great, great day when he comes back? To make up his jewels. If you haven't, but you would like to, here's how. Say this prayer with me. Say it, repeat it after me, and believe it in your heart. Heavenly Father, forgive me for my sins. Forgive my rebellion. Wipe away my iniquities from before your eyes. Strengthen me that I might live for you daily. Give me boldness and confidence that I might be a witness for you. That when the enemy comes against me, I can overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. I accept that free gift of life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now what I want you to do, as usual, get yourself a Bible. Begin to read that Bible. Highlight the verses. Memorize those verses because there's a day coming when the Bible will be taken away from us. We will not have the written scriptures. The only thing we will have is what is in our hearts. It will be taken from us. Now, join a church, a Bible-believing church, not one of those progressive churches that you can live anyway and do anything you want, who's a friend of the world. This is not God's way. For to be a friend of the world is to be at enmity with God. So find yourself a Bible-believing church who believes there's a right way to live and a wrong way to live. Who's, who believes that thus saith God, the Lord. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. And there you'll be with him forever and ever. What a glorious time. Eternity without any fears, worries, concerns. All your needs abundantly met. Well, Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.